Right, hello everybody. Back again, it's me, Campbell, Head of Conservation and Research at the Hawke Conservancy Trust. And back by popular demand is another session on white-headed vultures, because I didn't get time to talk about everything in the last uh, broadcast, I suppose you'd say, or session, I'm not sure what you call it. And it also struck me that probably there's ways of, uh, I've got some more props here today, and it struck me that there's probably ways of doing this having some sort of PowerPoint presentation or it's probably younger viewers saying why doesn't he just do X, Y or Z? Um, I suppose because I'm very 20th century in my approach so I like the manual thing. I can use PowerPoint when required but I just thought I'd point that out so I, I quite like my props I'm going to stick with those today. Um, so your part two about white-headed vultures. Well there's a lot of other things to talk about. There's just a couple of points I wanted to focus on today, or three probably, a few points. And I, I just wanted to go back to uh, starting off by talking about this pair here, which is, if you'll remember, is called Jacana pair. And we can see the, for those who weren't with us last time, you can see the female here, the male coming in, bringing some sticks, and the, the juvenile, the, the bird of the year, watching. Um, what I've found quite interesting about during observations of white-headed vultures is they do all these sorts of strange things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So although this pair, Jacana pair, bred every year, and this chick is about to fledge, so that the two adults here are going to be relieved of their breeding responsibilities in probably less than a month, and yet this male is still bringing nesting material into the nest. What's even more bizarre, I found, is that the when white-headed vultures copulate when they're mating, it's a very brief, very subtle process. But I saw a number of times where adults like this were copulating in front of the chick, the pre-fledged chick, and you kind of feel like you want to cover the chick's eyes and say, don't look away, um, which I always thought was very odd because these birds weren't about to lay another egg before the uh, previous year's juvenile or the juvenile in the nest had fledged. So that type of behaviour was extremely interesting. And I, I probably, with a degree of anthropomorphising, i.e. putting human emotions onto animal behaviour, um, you could wonder whether it was a reinforcement of the of the pair bond between the two. It, it seems to make sense. Um, but whether or not it's actually the case, we don't know. The other interesting feature I mentioned last time about the eagle in disguise situation with white-headed vultures and male white-headed vultures on a number of occasions did perform, I suppose you'd say, some eagle-type characteristics. So uh, another bird we have at the park, the Wahlberg's eagle, whose name is Forks. Well, Wahlberg's eagles in the wild, are and a lot of other aquiline eagles, they're well known for doing what I call big dipper flights. So while the female's at the nest, say this was an eagle nest, while the female sits at the nest, usually early on in the breeding season, the males fly off into the distance and they often ring up to great heights. Then they, they ring up and they almost stall and they do this sort of dipping flight like this. It's And they, they swoop down and then they come up again and it's quite dramatic to see. But it's almost, as far as I know, associated with aquiline eagles, mainly aquiline eagles. Uh, but on quite a few occasions, we also saw male white-headed vultures doing the same display which is extremely weird. To me, it's weird anyway, because you just don't see other African vultures doing that. Although I wonder whether the bearded vulture might do that, but I haven't read any reports or heard any stories that that's, that's what they do. The final point I wanted to make about, which goes back to the behavioral variation. I mentioned how this pair, this female in particular, was very aggressive and how this pair also maintained their nest even when the whiteback vultures were moving in, and in some cases, white-backed vultures take over the nests of white-headed vultures. Sometimes they even have a go at a lappet nest, just because they're quite bold that way. They usually get chased away. But the other interesting thing is we did helicopter surveys in this area for a number of years, and this is the only nest where the chick, almost every chick that you see in a nest when you fly over with a helicopter at a safe distance, all the chicks, they pancake into the nest, and they put their can't see me suit on and they sort of hide and they think, oh, the, the big bird will go away soon or whatever it is. But they, they're very uh, quiet and they sit flat in the nest. This check here, 
the three times we flew over this nest during three different breeding seasons, this chick stood up in the nest and shouted at the helicopter, flared its wings, looked up, glared at the helicopter and was not at all frightened. And you can't help but wonder whether that precocious and I suppose aggressive behaviour is inherited from the, over, the particularly aggressive female of Jacana pear. So interesting behavioural studies. It's always very difficult with behavioural or ethological studies just because of the sample sizes are very small. But super interesting stuff from this pair at Jacana and other pairs with the with the Big Dipper flight. Right, where am I going to now? Um, oh yes, so you could argue that one of the reasons white-headeds build their nests so large or at so, uh, such a large size and maintain, perhaps maintain a territory in the wild, uh, which they may, they may well do. And we've got some evidence to back that up because I'm going to show a picture here now. This is uh, a vulture we've been tracking for, for quite some time. Forgive it, it's, it's deliberately obscure. But if you can see here, all of these little dots, okay, and this, uh, this line here, which I've added to the map, you couldn't quite see the scale bar otherwise, is 40 kilometers or about 25 miles. So you can see that although that's that's quite some distance, this bird is maintaining its, uh, I suppose you could say, territory, probably a bit larger than we'd expect for a breeding territory because we'd expect or we assume that that's around about 100 square kilometers for white-headed vultures. But what I wanted to show this for is one that birds obviously maintain an area where they, adult birds, that is where they like to stay. This is white-headed vultures. But also importantly, if I flip this up um, and show you something else, that's the same the same dots, but that blue outline there is the boundary of the protected area where this bird and its partner live. It's in the middle of a national park. And you can see that these birds are almost like a pinball. They just hit the side of the protected areas and they come back. They very, very rarely venture outside protected areas. And this is... This enabled us to do some other work a few years ago because there's no records as far as I've ever found or heard of white-headed vultures breeding outside established protected areas. It might be a national park, it might be a game reserve or a forested area or some sort of gazetted protected area. And what that enabled us to do was use the protected area network in Africa and then we could estimate densities in big ones like this and then we could extrapolate that across Africa as a whole to generate a population, a global population estimate for white-headed vultures. And that's what we did. And there's fewer than about 5,000 birds left in the wild. But importantly, those numbers help inform the red listing process and were also why the species was uplisted to critically endangered because their population is small, but not just as it's small, it's also decreased uh, significantly over the last three generations, which is about 30 years for a white-headed vulture. So super interesting stuff. The, the general foraging patterns of a bird, this is over around about three months, maintaining itself within protected areas. And so that helped us estimate the, uh, the global population of this species. So I just wanted to go back and think, well, why would a bird like this be territorial? So I've got some other props here. So if you're maintaining a territory like an eagle would do, and there's a concept in ecology called the despotic distribution. So what that means is the best pairs, the fittest pairs, the uh, the strongest ones, I suppose you could say, they maintain the best territories. And as, a, um, as the quality of a habitat decreases as you move further and further away from those high value areas. So I thought, well, if white-headed vultures are maintaining a territory in inverted commas, or they're choosing to nest in areas that have a, uh, a benefit to their reproductive output, what would be the, the reasons for that? Or what would be the drivers for that? So what, what we did was we, we tried to look at whether or not vultures, white-headed vultures in particular, choose to nest in areas where there's more higher levels of biodiversity, more species, more potential prey opportunities because they're predatory and uh, or more um, more wildlife in general, more carcasses, more predators, more food, so higher resources. And then we compared white-headed vultures to uh, white-backed vultures 
And because whiteback vultures, they forage over these big areas, they're not likely to maintain a territory. And we thought, well, they're probably going to have nesting areas with a, a level of background biodiversity which is similar to random sites. So what we did was we uh, compared this and we, we did a lot of species surveys. So we uh, did a lot of visual surveys. We ran a lot of transects back and forth through nesting areas, random areas and whiteback vulture breeding areas to look at the uh, species abundance and diversity. And here's what we found. It was quite surprising. So I just bumped my desk there. So this is a basic graph showing us that, uh, that we've got three bars here. And uh, one is the pale one is the white headed vulture. The grey one in the middle there is the uh, random sites, and the black bar is the white-backed vultures. And what we can see here, this is the, the measure on the y-axis here, we've got um, effective number of species on this side and the species richness on that side. So this is, a, this is an index and this is an actual count. And you can see that uh, for both the index and the count, the white-headed vultures had a higher species abundance and an actual higher number of species recorded in the area compared to random sites but interestingly so did the white headed uh, so pardon me the white backed vultures and this is in an area where white headed vultures yes where white headed vultures and white backed vultures both nest in the savannah they just nest in uh, across the landscape but in other areas we get White-headed vultures still nesting in the savanna areas, but the white-backed vultures nest alongside rivers in riparian zones. And we can see the same pattern, except where the white-backed vultures are nesting alongside the rivers, they have a higher species index and also a higher number of species, a higher actual count. But in the same way that number of random, the number of species you find at random sites is still lower. So vultures, what this take-home message is that vultures potentially offer us a really good method of being indicators of species richness and biodiversity. We talk about vultures being ecosystem indicators from, a, from an ecosystem health perspective or perhaps even disease ecology, but these are some of the first data that we've got anywhere to show that actually where these birds choose to nest have higher levels of species abundance and diversity, which is super interesting. I thought I was really surprised when, when those results came up. So one more thing I just wanted to talk about today, which is a topic all on its own, actually, I have to say, and that is the wonderful story of this. Now, we all know white-headed vultures look different, and this is the topic of sexual dimorphism in white-headed vultures. So here we have the female. This is actually different to jacana pair. This is not jacana pair. But we have the female with the white secondaries here and the male with the grey or pale grey or sometimes just dark secondaries. And before you go, oh, hang on, that bird hasn't got a white head. That's because these birds have just been feeding in a carcass all by themselves, I should say. And the male got his head a little bit grubby. That's why he doesn't have the lovely white head. But I did want to spend some time looking at or discussing reversed sexual dimorphism in white-headed vultures and the reversed sexual dimorphism is a term which means that the female is bigger, heavier and a generally larger bird than the male and in white-headed vultures that RSD is, if we call it that, is around about 15% on average. So I'm just looking at the timer and I've got a feeling for part three coming along here because this topic of reversed sexual dimorphism in white-headed vultures is is extensive and reverse sexual dimorphism in raptors in general which we all know well people who are fond of raptors know very well that the females are generally larger and a rule of thumb because it doesn't always hold true is that the more predatory the species the more pronounced the rsd so for example a peregrine falcon she's quite a lot bigger than the teasel then these are in about two-thirds the size that's that's commonly stated but in eagles in particular uh, female bald eagles as we know cheyenne for example are much much bigger than danebury bigger more powerful and so there's lots and lots of uh, theories and hypotheses as to why rsd exists so what i'm going to do now is leave you with this fascinating picture here of these 
male and female white-headed vultures with a thought for the day before we come back for part three to talk about RSD and white-headed vultures. And that is that this is the only species of vulture in Africa that shows plumage dimorphism. All the other vulture species are monomorphic between the sexes. The sexes look the same. In fact, we often wonder how they tell each other apart. And so you could begin to ask, well, why is that the case? So that's the thought for the day. It's the only species of vulture that shows reversed sexual dimorphism, i.e. the females are bigger, and also the only one that shows distinct and regular plumage dimorphism between males and females. So I'll leave that with you a thought for the day. I hope you've enjoyed this part two of white-headed vultures, and I look forward to talking to you again and focusing on this fascinating topic of reversed sexual dimorphism in the hunting vulture, as I call it, the white-headed vulture. Thanks.